So not only would it reduce the amount of human intervention, but it would bring benefits in many fields. If we consider industry, where hardware and software is verified, it would boost the ability to do this, and in turn would make the system safer, more reliable, and cheaper to manufacture. As Joseph mentioned earlier, it's a very active research area. So many first order automated theory improvers compete in competition each year to find which one's best. And the amount of automation available is typically restricted by the logic that underlies the system. So we have this trade-off of expressivity versus automation. So the systems I'm dealing with deal with higher order logic, which is typically quite hard to bring automation to. So we must find novel ways of being able to do it. So the way that I'm interested is by utilising proof libraries. Now these are included in many theorem proofs. And they contain many examples of successful proofs. And these proofs have normally been provided by an expert in the field. They cover a wide range of complexities and domains. Algebra, set theory, industrial proofs, etc. And most importantly to me, they specify the sequences of proof steps, although of course you can get the goal that was proven and any sub goal information as required. So, my idea is can we use this information to automate new proofs? Now, there are some ways in existence at the minute to try to do this. One of them is called Sledgehammer. So, at a quite high level, it puts, uh, it uses the knowledge available at any given point and tries to extract facts based on the goal that's trying to be proven. These are then converted to first order logic, where automated their improvers try and attack the problem. If this works, the facts are passed back into Isabel and the proof is reconstructed. Another way would be to provide the user with proof hints, so automatically maintaining the knowledge that is available at any given point. And I know that Jonathan and Katya have been working on something here in Dundee called LR4PG. So you have to correct me if I've got anything wrong about your system. But at a high level, again, we abstract information from the proof library and the new goal to be proven. And from out of it, we want to get clusters of lemma families back. The user can then inspect these lemmas and their proofs to see if there's any strategy that could be used to prove the new goal. So, the approach that I want to introduce is called tactic mining. And I'm going to give some terminology first before we go in and discuss the actual approach. So, I want to define a useful sequence, which is a sequence of proof steps that could be useful in proving some new goal. A tactic is a function that is applied to a proof state that can either complete the proof or advance the proof so we get closer to ultimately proving it. And tactic mining is automatically ident or forming tactics based on large libraries of existing proofs. So, given a simple example, say for instance we found these two sequences, sequence 1 and sequence 2, we could form a tactic that captures this behaviour in the form of this here. So I want to do this on a larger scale to try and prove more complex proofs, you know, goals, sorry. So there has been some work carried out in Edinburgh on tactic mining by Hazel Duncan, supervised by Alan Bundy. So her approach takes a proof library and abstracts that into sequences of proof sets. It then searches for commonly occurring sequences within the library and generalizes these into tactics. These are then passed back into the theorem prover and brute force applied to the new goal. So there are some limitations to Hazel's work which I'd just like to cover. So I only proved moderately effective on the test set. Around 33% of the proofs in a test set could be proven by the tactics that she had. There was no sub-goal information included. She only looked for commonly occurring sequences of proof steps. 
And of course, the brute force tactic application at the end took up a lot of time and wasn't really very efficient. So by taking all of this into account, I want to introduce my tactic mining approach now. So the first step is that the user would call the tactic miner. And from that, we want to take information from the proof library and about the new goal. So that's different from Hazel's approach, where she only looked at the proof library. So from this information, we want to find useful sequences of proof steps. So these are the sequences of proof steps that could prove most profitable in proving the new goal. We then want to generalise these into tactics, because it's quite unlikely that finding the proof steps alone, you'd be able to just reapply them to a new goal, because they're quite specific. So we must employ generalisation techniques to cover this. So the tactics, once they've been generalised from the sequences, are passed back into the theorem prover and applied to the new goal. And if we do manage to prove the goal, then we will update the proof library with the relevant information. So this opens up a number of interesting questions that I want to cover over the course of my PhD to find answers to. So the first one is how can we deal with the complex higher order language? So, a proof in higher order logic can contain various additional constructs such as variable instantiations and proof directives. You also find that one sequence of proof steps can solve many proofs and conversely, uh, one goal can be solved by many sequences of proof, proof steps. Across different users and different theories, you also come across different proof styles. So the proofs in, say, an algebra theory might have a different style to them than that in a set theory. So we have to overcome all of these obstacles and try and find a way that we can see the distinguishing features of a proof, generalise it into something more widely applicable. The second question is which data mining techniques can help us in our work? So there's two distinct stages. Uh, stage three, where we want to find this useful sequences of proof steps, and stage four, where we generalise them into more applicable tactics. So because there's two different stages, you probably want to utilise two different approaches. You might want some statistical numeric methods for finding the sequences and then symbolic methods to deal with the, the, the relationals. You want to find relations between the sequences to generalise them into tactics. And that is actually an open research question. Nobody's come up with an optimal method of doing this. So who knows, maybe I can find something over the course of my PhD. But we also have to consider how the theorem prover and the tactic miner will communicate. So the tactic miner is a separate entity to the theorem prover because we want to open up the possibility of incorporating it into more than one theorem prover. So we have to find ways of the theorem prover communicating with the tactic miner and then conversely getting the tactics back into the theorem prover. So some theorem provers do have tactic specification languages, but others you have to hard code them using the programming language. So this is another obstacle that we want to overcome. Question four is how can we make use of negative information? So most examples so far have only concentrated on successful proofs. So we want to try and find to what extent we can include negative information as well. And this can be gathered in the form of user input. And we could also try and have a look at the traces from existing automated tools to see if we can get failed sequences of proof steps out that way as well. And this would enable us to have a supervised learning approach. So I'm currently at the following stage of my work. I chose to have a look at the Isabel theorem prover and to try and get out the sequences of proof steps that are being used in a proof. So it's actually a challenge because they have these proof terms, and it would appear that 
the, the way they're stored in the proof term is not necessarily the way they're actually applied in the proof. So I need to try and find a standard way of extracting the actual order that they were applied, not the order that they're recorded. And then I want to, I'm currently considering learning techniques and taking a data mining course at the moment at university and trying to figure out which techniques might help us to solve this problem. I think I finished quite short, but if you have any questions to ask, then please, at any point now or during the workshop, I'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you. feedback mechanism. So you had a recommendation that some proof step or sequence of steps was possibly a good one. You try it, yeah. and now you learn that it either, it either worked or it didn't work in the end. It got you to a proof or it didn't. Uh, how do you now use that information to modify future behavior? So if it was successful, we would obviously update the proof library with this new example. And the same way that one can do negative information, we would also record that, okay, this didn't work for this particular goal. And then from that future goal, we can say, okay, that might not be such a useful sequence to do. You yeah. give one, one example there, how you combine these tactics once you have found them, that you have introduced an or. Yeah. Are there other ways how you would combine them? Or yeah, of course. The, the, that was just a very simple example. So obviously there could be a clean star for repetition, um, an AND combinator, and I suppose you'd have to come up with a grammar of exactly how you wanted to express express these tactics, and that's something that I will be considering a bit later on in my work. Oh, I, I have a question, uh, or oh, maybe two. So, so you mentioned that Hazel Duncan had 33% uh, success on a test set, yeah. was it correct? Uh, what, what kind of test set what was it? It was, a, it was in the domain of higher order logic, so the basic sort of... But how, how many proofs, theorems, etc. Uh, uh, 500 were learned from. Uh, and, then, and it was part of Isabel Hall, yeah. or... Uh, oh, okay. And... Um, Jacques Pierre, you know Jacques Pierre from the Edinburgh? Yeah. He did his big proof of uh, Kepler's conjectures. I, I can't remember now, yeah. but he is the person who asked. Oh. He, but it was a really yeah. big formalization yeah. of some, some oh. piece of mathematics. Yeah. Uh, and so, so 33 person sounds, if, if you could automatically prove 33 person, that, that sounds pretty, pretty not nice to me or really. Quite a surprise that, that it works so, so well. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, I think definitely this. This approach forms the basis of my work, and I want to try and oh, yeah. improve on this. And, and the second question, I, I never really uh, knew, knew much about it, but, but I, I always thought that uh, Lucas Dixon was also doing some, some kind of planning for, for Isabel, etc. Are you aware of that work, and uh, that does it somehow relate to, to, to your work, or is it totally different? From what I understand of that approach, that provides a way of the user encoding a strategy for proving some some goal. So, so the user has to. I, I believe so. Yeah, it is the work oh. that I'm thinking about. Oh, okay. It's called I piece of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe the user has to encode the strategy. Uh, so that that was all automated creation of plans. Not, uh, not that uh, I, I don't believe so. Well, in Alan Bundy's group there was, oh. I think, several PhD students, the postdocs there, they did yeah. lemma formation for, oh. it, yeah. was, it was not for any proof in the world, mm. but for uh, a certain specific yeah. libraries they could do it. And I think today we have a PhD oh. student of Woodmont Crow who, who was in that group in the Palmas. Now it's a it oh. to have it, what well, he'll probably tell us oh. a bit more about that approach, yeah. symbolic machine learning basically. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, thank you. All right, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, so the next song is by Jonathan and Katja. And Jonathan, yeah. By Jonathan. Uh, uh, so Jonathan is from here. Uh, Katja is also from here. <laughs> uh,
and uh, actually, I'll find it. 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 I'll find to introduce a comparison between the techniques that are using proof of the recognition in automatic term programs and the ones that are using interactive term programs. So let's start with a brief motivation of this work. Well, first, uh, we can say that nowadays uh, automatic term programs and tools like chat solvers and SMP solvers are faster and efficient than some years, some years ago, and they are applied in different contexts as uh, program replication, scaling, uh, test scaling generation, and so on. And in the case of interactive program, we have that uh, there have been a bridge with dependent types, content types, and uh, they provide a rich program, uh, rich programming environments, and they have been using well, important mathematical groups. Here we have uh, some examples that just uh, as commented in this talk. And uh, also, data interactive groups have been applied in, in industrial groups, like for instance, the one that uh, Thomas uh, commented before, the, the verification of the microcomer process. But there are some challenges when we are using these tools. Uh, first of all, uh, due to the big, the huge size of, of the libraries of ATPs and IGPs, it makes it difficult to produce, uh, in some cases, these libraries. Then there are problems related to manual handling and try to prove the use of all the team development mode because everyone has uh, his own style of proving. And also it's difficult to compare uh, different groups uh, across several libraries and methods. So a way to deal with this problem consists in using machine learning techniques. And well, we are trying to present some of these techniques. And to this end I want to use an example which comes from uh, the Java machine. The Java machine is a, a stack based as a machine with kind of security about that code. I will provide an example. And then what we wanted to do to, to test our approaches was to uh, model a subset of the Java machine in Coq. Coq is an interactive term improver. And uh, to this end, we define an interpreter for the NDM. And we also prove some theorems about this And oh, well, this work is inspired by this work of the move in the Asia to So well, here we have a simple program in Java, that is the factorial program. And here in the center we have the Java byte code which is generated from uh, this Java code. Then on the left side we have a DDM model which consists of a counter and a stack, well, a counter will indicate the instruction that we are going to execute, a stack where uh, we store some intermediate, uh, intermediate results, and then the end of the file. So, for instance, if we want to compute the factorial of 5, uh, we start with 5 and then other variables, and then we start executing the file. For instance, this introduce one in the stack, the second one the stores the variable in the other variables, and so on. And if we execute the, the whole process, at the end we obtain that at the top of the stack, we obtain a the result. Okay, the factorial file, which is 100. So what we want to prove in this case is that for every natural number that we have, then if we run the byte code associated with the, with the factorial program, we are going to obtain on the top of the stack the uh, expected result. So this was just a running example that we are going to use. And now let us briefly explain uh, the proof pattern recognition in automatic code. Well, so the idea here is that a proof is undertaken in these, uh, in these tools uh, using well, various elements that are used to rewrite or simplify the goal and this is this proof. So the goal of using machine learning techniques in automatic improvements consists in improving the uh, premise selection as the separate line of study uh, during this talk. So here we have some references. And the idea is that we can use these uh, automatic tools to 
uh, automate the proof in the proof. So here we have a scheme. Here we have the, the first of the fragments so of interactive term provers. Then from this uh, first of the fragment, we can extract features and uh, use the right term to select the currencies that can be useful to prove those lemmas. And then those currencies are using automatic provers and then record captives when we have the book into the industry. So imagine that we want, uh, in our particular case, in the beginning, we need to prove that uh, a part of the proof is that we need to prove that the factorial version and the target version, and so the target version, version of the factorial are equivalent. So the first step is consisting in building a classifier for every lemma of the line. So here we have some neural networks, so we will have one neural network and some other and other device uh, technique in for each demo and then we have a training phase for each classifier. In this case uh, we say that if a lemma A is used in the group of lemma B, then the value of the classifier A apply, when we apply B is one and otherwise is two. So we have uh, some like variables to train our our program. And then we have the testing phase. We want to know if a lemma will be useful when proving a, a new one. So for instance, in this case, we want to prove that factorial n is equal to factorial a n. So first, we need to construct a binary vector, which represents the, the features of, of, the, of our formula. In our case, we have uh, several terms. Each one of, of these cells represents a term of the universe terms that, were, that we are dealing with. So if we have one in one cell, that means that our formula contains uh, that term and zero otherwise. And for instance, this is a classifier for multiplication, the associative to multiplication. And what it returns is a value between zero and one. Zero and one, which says uh, the likelihood of using that lemma in the, in the group that we are that we are. So the idea that the feature extraction are extracted from first of the formulas. Uh, we use a uh, star vector because we can have a lot of plants in, in the universe. And we have a classifier for every lemma in the lab. Then the machine learning tools are based on supervised uh, learning. You can see that we have a training phase and a testing phase. And they use algorithms such as maybe uh, learning or SVN. And as we are working with the Spark method, we need to use a uh, tool like a Snow or others like uh, use the same. And the results that are obtained with these tools are uh, quite appealing because they improve the, the they increase the number of theorems which are proven automatically up to 20 or 30 percent. So that was to uh, prove pattern recognition in automatic theorem prover. Now let us focus on interactive theorem proof, which is uh, what Katya and I are doing. So in ITPs, in interactive theorem proofs, uh, the proof, uh, the real proving theorem is completely different to automatic proof because it's the user, the one who needs to be the, to guide the, the proof, providing the tasks. So the goal here consists in applying machine learning techniques to find common proof patterns across uh, the person, libraries, um, and user, and provide proof things uh, by means of proof families. Okay. So we have developed a, a software, which is called MTE, uh, which is available to the world. And um, uh, after, uh, after this session on, on the coffee break, you can ask me to, to show how, how this works. And well, here is what well, Proof General, MRCOP is an extension of Proof General, which is uh, an interface for COP, where we provide the tactics and interact with the system. And here we have a small simulation of the Proof General environment. On the top of this environment, we have the lemma that we want to prove, and on the bottom we have the goal that we are proving at that moment. And on the top, we are going to introduce tactics. For instance, uh, we have here for all A and A things. 
Then we apply the, the move tactic which moves M to the context. Then we have apply induction using the again tactic and we obtain two cases, the base case and the inductive case. And um, for instance to prove the, the base case we can do it with this uh, reward. So now imagine that we have uh, we have led to, to this point and we get a start when proving this this left. So we can ask an for PD to provide us some uh, lem some lemmas which have been proved in a similar way and then try to extract a common strategy from them to be applied in our So here is a general review of an for PD. Well, let's see that this provided uh, similar lemmas. Okay. And well, the way of, uh, the first of, first of all, we have to extract some features. And these features are extracted from the way of working of, uh, of the user. So we don't call only the, the shape of the ball, but the way that the user uh, fits that ball. So, for instance, uh, well, we have this kind of table, which is all the, the information about the first ball that we are proving. For instance, when you apply move, and uh, uh, like the tactic is having a tight move, uh, there is one tactic that remains not, and so on. So, in this way, we are building our table, and this table is then cutting to obtain a feature that we can see in the lab. So, this is the feature extraction procedure, which is where we're using this idea of proof traces. And the feature vectors they are of a fixed size of 30 or less. And it's different to the one of automatic program where we have a spark line. So, uh, and well, the machine learning tools that we, have, we use are based on unsupervised learning. So, unsupervised machine learning, I would think, because in this case, we don't have a tax or lab label which says, uh, the proof of Alema was useful or not. Uh, we don't have that kind of information, so we need to use some supervised learning. And we use uh, well known algorithms such as Gaussian, Kinnis, and Parallel which are implemented in tools like Unlab. And this is the interface of MFPD, it's completely integrated in Proof General, so a person who is used to, to work. To prove the error doesn't find any problem for doing this. And when uh, the user invokes uh, a method to be, he obtains something like this, saying that this lemma that you are proving is similar to these three lemmas. So then the user needs to inspect those lemmas, trying to find a, proof, a common proof strategy from them, and then apply that strategy to the concrete. And as a conclusion, I say that uh, different machine learning tools and methods can be a suitable for APPs and ideas. Um, Interactive theorem provers. Oh, Manfred is one of the Isabel interactive theorem provers, right? You, uh, we use, yes, we use you, you, you are now at Proof General. <coughs> are, are you using Proof we, General? We have used Proof General for that, but they have then also switched to, to another. Oh, to JEdit. Yeah, to the oh, JEdit okay. interface. So we have then also made that uh, switch to the JEdit. I'm planning to do it for JEdit soon. Uh, well, uh, VA is for Isabel, and I think that is it is not version for code. I think I mean, that uh, uh, Macarius is working on building a, a similar system for code, but it's not available there. And well, Coke uh, has another interface, which is Coke ID, but most of the people that, at least I know, use Proof General, so it makes sense to integrate in. Yeah, the DS is what people all use. Yeah. Yeah. John, so maybe you can explain uh, the example when the ML property found families of proofs. Just okay. tell us about what, what it actually found. Okay, so well, this is the proof that the, well, this is the auxiliary function for the factorial. 
So you don't have to put that. Yeah, well, I'll just, well, just tell what these yeah. lemmas are. Why, why well, were they suggested by now? Well, these lemmas are also uh, related to the multiplication, the power, and the exponential of the Java virtual machine. So they are quite similar. They follow the, the same strategy that you need to... You don't use, you don't directly prove the, the lemma, but you need to generalize. For instance, in this case, uh, we don't prove that uh, the term function of the rank of the factorial is equal to the factorial derivative, but you need to generalize uh, doing this product of A times the, the factorial to the result. Um, for the case of the multiplication, the power and the exponential is quite similar, so you can use the, the same idea. Uh, coming to the previous talk, uh, are you also thinking about, for example, mining really the tactics and applying them to, to get the truth kind of fully automatically inside Coq or? Uh, well, that's, that is future goal, but uh, this is completely independent of that. Yeah. Uh, we think that uh, finding proof uh, families can be useful for people to, to see the strategy because it's quite a difficult problem to, to from those proof, try to generalize and obtain a common proof uh, strategy which can be applied. It's something that uh, it need, it still needs some some user interaction. Uh, so 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 could, could this be used, for example, to uh, for, for 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 the previous talk to to, to find the the suspicious sets of yeah. yeah. Well, you can imagine that uh, you are doing a proof, then you obtain proof families, and then from those proof families, you have to find the, the common proof strategy. So yeah. I think that that is the the work yeah. done. So I, I have partly missed this, the statistical aspects which you have in your yeah. title. So, so what, what, what is the statistic kind of reasoning that you just got? Uh, the statistics is done by the cluster in our white things. Well, from this table, we obtain a, a feature vector. And then from each level of the library, we obtain uh, this kind of vector. And those vectors are clustered to obtain uh, families of, of proof which are similar. Yeah. Uh, just, just one quick question. Uh, do you look at any example where you have, like, you know, I don't know, I mean, like an implementation of, for example, a um, uh, program computing the Fibonacci number uh, and using that in the program and the other one using, like, you know, just the naive recursive algorithm? Like, I don't know, is there, do you have any examples like that? Yeah, it's the, the same idea that here. Right? Same idea, right? Yeah. Uh, we drive with Fibonacci and we obtain uh, that Fibonacci is similar to, to factorial and also with lemmas. It's yeah. course, more like the, the same strategy that you need to generalize to be apply. Right. Also, so how, how much do you use um, the really just the structure of of the theorem instead of lo looking at the particular symbols. So like for example, Stefan Schultz really at, at some point they wanted to do something which was totally symbol independent. He, he was really abstracting over totally over the symbolic layer and, and just replacing the symbols and the counters and the predicates with basically higher higher order variables and, and co co doing the nearest neighbor in this case, which is Faster thing, also on, on, on that those things. Do you consider the symbols? Or, or yeah, we also consider well, not all symbols, but for instance, we, we are consider the, the top symbol which is used. Yeah. Um, but uh, we also have to, to focus on on the tactics <coughs> which are applied. Uh -huh. So we have some information about the the symbol, but uh, we don't focus on the concrete shape of the whole. Like, and that can be uh, quite difficult to, to find all the all the all the same goals. So uh, yeah. So 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 I, I, it seems to me that at this point you you, you could you could use more features gen generated from from the goal. I'm, I'm not really sure about mm -hmm. yeah. kind of, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Questions? Okay, then let's hear it. So, do we have?
have the next blue one. Numbering that each hypothesis, 
but that doesn't help us with the other problem, which uh, is about not storing many assumptions and it doesn't store the proof history, both of which we need to refer back to. Like, Instead, to get around this, we use that strategy to have to generate from that a proof tree, which the EDM uses as a sort of proof. And that an example of what a proof tree looks like. So it's not the best form that we don't have. And um, I know it looks a little confusing to be a little bit more tall. And it's a slight change. Each node in this tree represents a step in the proof, and the edges are simply edges. They don't represent anything anymore. Each node keeps track of the goal that's being worked on, the sub goals generated, whether a tactic is applied to that, the tactic which is applied, any assumptions either one to the global more affecting that, and any fixed variables that affect that particular goal. Still two drawbacks in that we still cannot we still have to replay the whole proof to look at the specific and uh, look at the specific branch again. And you, in that location, it's not entirely the first course going on. Well, why it cannot be replayed? What was, was the problem? Um, um, you, you, you have to start again from the beginning and rerun the whole thing if you want to look at a specific. Uh, so, so, so it doesn't keep enough information like the not uh, look. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Um, so, from this, we want to start generating our structured proofs. This structure in there is the Islamic Islamic framework. Um, as opposed to the procedural proofs that you can generate as well. Um, the procedural proofs, they are quite step by step. They do include all the tactic information that you need to apply, but it's not immediately obvious from them which goals are, which tactics are being applied to which goals, whether or not one tactic is evaluated one goal or five, for example. And it also includes, they also include a couple of black boxes, such as the same but also tactics, where it's not immediately clear what's going on And I know the user framework can include simplification, can include the auto tactic as well. But there you, you kind of have to know what is going on before you can apply them. You can't just write apply simp and see what comes out of the other end. Um, so these sorts of proofs will always begin with a statement of the lemma and list fixed variables and global assumptions required to these. Represent, represent the proof of a goal as a block, if you like. And the laws be a section of these proofs are starting with proof, end of the QED, and in between those will be the proof of any particular goal. And these should be nested within each other, in that the, the block represents the proof of a particular goal. If that generates sub goals, the block represents the dead proof will be contained within that, and so on, and so on. And these have the advantage that if a user is just really a structured proof, you would have a fair idea of what's going on, and you can improve it straight into the improve and that will understand what is happening. So to generate our structured proofs, we can start at any particular node in this tree. Generally for the full proof, obviously you can start in the root, but if there's one particular branch you want to look at in more detail, you can start at any particular node and just generate the structured proof for that branch of the tree. And we we'll start by projecting the whole goal, followed by any or by the tactic that applies to that and the sub goal that, that tactic generates. So for example, using the same layer, we start with Proof, the initial sub goal that we get from applying that tactic to it. And the ellipse in the middle will be filled in as you go on with the proof of this sub goal. And so on, many sub goals send it to that. But we request that um, each sub goal that is generated is represented by another node in the tree. Um, and by progressively analyzing these nodes, we can generate. We can develop the rest of this tree. Specifically, we want to look at the reasoning steps used to evaluate each goal, which is storage of task information in each of these nodes. Um, it will either have a forward reasoning step, that is dependent on some assumption, to evaluate it, or a backward reasoning step, that is entirely dependent on things you approve as a problem. There are four possible cases that we'll come up with. No, it's still open. In these cases, for whatever reason, the theme proof can evaluate any further. And when we have a there, we simply use the map of solid, which tells the proof to um, treat that soft goal as if it's been frozen and move on to the proof. A little bit naughty in that if there is something that is causing it to fall over, then we need to know what that is before we put it out of it. But it will stop the whole thing generating anything else, which, in which 
if you're talking about money and health, you can place it with that on working and you don't have to give up the entire thing. Okay, so we back and set those of those generated, the simplest type. We apply it actually to a goal, it doesn't generate any soft goals. Happy days, that's the end of our branch of the tree, and we can move on the rest of the proof. The blue, sorry, and the code there, the script at the bottom there is an example. The on the right, the top right there, that's the generic, that's the generic move, assume we have something I goal I we can prove that by something so we don't need to go further. And an example on the bottom of an example from the structure proof for the line we have that this policy was involved in the moment. Okay, so it's about the step in our software generated. And um, similar to the first step, again, when we evaluate when we evaluate this lemma, the software generated, so we'll move on. And we can evaluate that then in the same way as we evaluated the initial one, and so on on the tree. And case D is forward step. It's handled in the same way as a backward step, or the field is etc. it is dependent on that assumption. Um, and we can identify that as, so we can identify that as we use a forward using step to, to do it. And it is it's not necessarily the case once you use a forward step that field all the way through. We um, it can be the case of forward steps followed by backward step, vice versa, and all the way through the opposite and so on. So that leaves us with the overall structured proof of that. If we have an example of everything apart from it falling over with a solid amount of the initial lemma, which has been evaluated, given us that initial goal, evaluated again, we discovered that. In order to prove the next goals, we have to pay it on the assumption, so we have to use a forward step, and then from that we can use a backward step, which doesn't produce any sub goals. Same with that, they're still here, and then again we have the tactical information. And comparing that to the true, it's you kind of have to um, look at each block in isolation, if you like, you have one side there, and then you're there, containing one side there, and then you're there, and stuff like that, stuff. And Looking at the tree, go back to that. Looking at the way it's proving the goals, working down, just got the G, and then applying the assumption rate for the get goal, I'm goal J there. Looking at the tactics, and um, sorry, so the goals coming down the way the tactics we apply in order going up the way. So we start off by applying the multiplication and then Conjunction of the conjunction of the yeah, so from that, so from that we can generate the structure of proofs. I know it's quite a small example here. I have tested on some larger ones and some slightly better ones, not all quite as simple as that. Taking this further, we would like to be able to support our rapid proof trees. And that one didn't look too big, but as soon as you get into a larger projection, it doesn't get very big very quickly. So it's a connected thing, it's like anything else. And to remove the redundant information from generated proofs, in particular, these bits here, we don't need all of that information in order to prove that. And while it's nice to have it, again, once you get into larger projections, too much information ends up being confusing for the user and it's not necessary for the field improvement. It can be a bit of a double edged And as I said earlier, try and put this into a future field of view to try and generate the, the structured proofs that we are going uh, from the strategy so that we are going um, in my life of work. The record is all right. Thank you. redundant information, there are two ways how you can look at that. The one is, you say this is obsolete when you look backward, what you need in the end from the proof, that's logically redundant. And then when you look from a human point of view, and that may be true then also for automated system, you say, well, this is in some sense not completely relevant information. So if, if you had not given that in the first place, it would have been easy to regenerate it in a way. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do you look into these two aspects, or is it rather the one than the other? It, it's a bit of both. Uh, right. Like I say, we, we're very conscious of the fact that the more detail you put into these things, the more, the more um, scope there is for errors to creep in as well. And if, if we don't need the information there, the theory proved to do its job, it is not strictly necessary because at the end of the day we are the emphasis on this is more to get something that we can work with feeling proof rather than it, it's a nice added bonus that it's immediately um, understandable by the user as well as opposed to that. Uh, you showed how you generated those trees from mm. just one proof. Mm. Can you do it from several proofs? There is if you had, say, three proofs yeah, and try to generate the same tree from three proofs, that would help you to realize which one of the proof steps are actually uh, just is to sugar or, you know, just yeah. a particular um, step that is not general for, for that kind of proof. Uh, yeah, that, that is one of the things that gives it doing with it. Um, especially if you get three, like, for example, if you have three to five, whatever, proofs. That follow a similar strategy. We can we can generate what we think the tree will look like. We can try and fit that to the proofs and then identify what identify what is most really necessary and what most trust the excess stuff. That's that is one of the things we'll be looking for potentially if we have a quick report. Because I suppose if it's just an algorithm that tries to generate these things, it's very difficult to point out which Parts of the proof are actually interesting and which are just uh, implied by the syntax or Yeah, and um, that's, that's something that probably the Slack language would handle more than developing proof trees. The Slack language is itself still under development, and um, so yeah, there's only possibility that six months time this will be completely done. But, um, So, so how can, can I now take it and run it over all of the whole or all of the stages? It's, I would be reasonably confident that you could do it with a fair amount of it. It's not completely bulletproof. Uh -huh. I have managed to break it a couple of times okay. in ways I didn't expect. So um, it still needs a little bit of debugging, but certainly for a level I want to go up there. And I, I have to, so, so, so I have a colleague called Frank Niedek who had done a lot of investigations with the internet groups and he just did something very similar for a whole life. It's, it's called MIS3 because all, all these e desired things they originate from, from the desired natural deduction style. So, so, so he basically translates the technical proofs with written as natural life into exactly this kind of spectral, spectral proof. And so, so he also translates between the two. And, and, and the way he solves the, the, the detail, what, like to, to, to which detail you would go, well, he, he goes exactly to the detail to, to, to which the user ran, ran, uh, he, he was writing the technical proof. So, so he kind of has one-to-one -one correspondence between, between the, the granularity of justification and all of but he was also thinking about making it, for example, less informative at some point or more informative at some point. And uh, there is another related work uh, that, that's one of these guys called Carol Pong, and he really transforms these uh, spectral groups by uh, taking one of some very complex as possible, like generalizing the line. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the next speaker, uh, and you are going to pronounce yourself, is Zonia Mohuwa. Okay, it's, and it's a transcript, it's like also. Um, sorry? Uh, and uh, it's on the application of machine learning to parse the interesting procedures.
presentation about uh, an application of machine learning to RCF decision procedures. So machine learning is used to uh, help to select the best RCF decision procedure for match tasking. So we would ask, let's ask, oh. Uh, we can get the value of the precision and the report 
from outskirts of SEMI. Mm. Then after we get value, we, uh, we combine the models for each uh, decision procedure classifier, then compare the margin values of uh, C uh, classifier. The classifier with most quality for this negative margin was selected. Uh, the experiment was done on 825 match testing problems in TPTP format library. Uh, the total number of problems crude out of 194 testing problems was used to measure the efficacy of the machine learning process. Uh, although the result uh, is like improved in the margin, but uh, machine learning selection uh, certainly did the better than any individual fixed decision provision. We can say machine learning can uh, successfully prove 163 problems out of 194, which is better than any uh, fixed uh, decision procedure. Uh, so what could be future work? Uh, in future work, I would like to uh, extend uh, extend to the heuristic selection within the decision procedures because for each decision procedure, uh, there are like various heuristic settings uh, which present uh, different uh, uh, decision algorithms. Uh, we can also extend the, the range of the features because at the moment the features are uh, mainly two types. The first is the presence of uh, special functions to say uh, each formula is sign function or sign function is within the formula or not, or number of variables contained uh, in the formula. The larger uh, the larger number of variables contained in the formula, which means uh, the formula is more difficult. Uh, later, we would like to uh, find more features which can uh, better characterize the problem. And uh, mm, if we got enough uh, number of features, we can apply our feature selection techniques in order to find the uh, most suitable uh, set of features. Uh, in the end, we would like to provide a free feedback for development of other decision procedures to uh, actually help the help to improve the efficiency of the uh, so okay, I can start. Uh, so you, you, you said you had uh, three Three labels, basically. You you only choose whether it will be done by Mathematica. Uh, or this way or Kerkadon. So if uh, it's the fastest, then that way will be like uh, labeled as positive one. Uh -huh. for the but could, could, couldn't you, for example, further parameterize the C3? Oh, the, that's what I mentioned for the like a uh, heuristic selection data. Because uh -huh. for Mathematica and that way they have like different settings. Yeah. I would like to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so then the label set or, or, or uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And uh, so, so you tested it on 825 Uh in TPTP format. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and do you know for all of them that they they are good or? Uh, no, no. Some of them, some of them are approved. So, so do you like know? all of them are approved, but they say some of them are true, some of them are false. Some of them are kind of uh, unconscious, but yes. uh, and uh, do, do you know how, how many of them in theory? Uh, it's like uh, six hundred and uh, eighty problems are approved. Uh, so, so you can do like yes. thirty percent of all. Oh no, no. Of, this is the yeah. like the testing set because I first uh, I, I will further split into uh, oh it's just the one one hundred and twenty four and testing set. Yeah. Testing set is 194. So and the rest of the training set? Or all the training set and the uh, validation set. For uh, the validation yeah. set, it's used to like, uh, find the best uh, kernel, kernel yeah, function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so, so, so the the training data are those which, which you can do. So, so it is uh, like yes. six hundred. At least I know yeah. the results of each. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So, so, so you know how well these are to get first on on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So, because like uh, for each particular aspect of decision procedure, they are always like uh, good at. Uh, for a particular set of problems with like, the yes. features. And do you also consider the time which which it takes to solve you using the particular methods? Like, well, that's my current experiment by like, uh, changing the different aspects of time to uh, say uh, the behavior of each. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, we're talking about paper. So, mm -hmm. so when we uh, are training, mm -hmm. You assign a score based on yeah, yeah. which seems to be the same if it wasn't the fastest method as if it didn't succeed yeah. at all. Isn't that rather crude? Would you do much better by distinguishing those, or does it really not make any difference? Because uh, we only need to choose uh, like the best work the most So yes. if like uh, only a so one if, one if, if I had a method that was Consistently, not quite the fastest. Uh, not think, quite the fastest. The I, would think, I, would, I would think it's a much better method than one that never successfully answered yes or no at all. Oh, then yeah. I would pick up the, the one. But, then, but, your, but your score doesn't distinguish those. Uh, but I have the margin. It's like uh, uh, if one uh, one decision procedure is like uh, at least uh, twenty faster than the other one I would set a label as one. Otherwise they are just like treated the same. Maybe I'll talk to you later. Okay. Oh, we, we are almost doing low on time right now, so we can actually <laughs> ask some more questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so are these three methods, um, I know I missed a bit of another question, are these three methods very similar or are they very you know, they're entirely different? So mm -hmm. three methods here. They are, they are quite different uh, in through, like different types of problems. So that's the reason we try to uh, use machine learning to help with the selection. Because when the new problem appears, we can based on the features of the new problem to say, OK, which decision procedure I could choose. Oh, uh, are, are there any more choice points in the Matikarski so, so, so now, now, now you have this choice point that you, you can choose between the, the three methods and very old you can parameterize and differently, etc. But, but I can imagine that, that in you know, Matikarski you, you, you have also a lot of other choice points. Like you, you can either choose to, to, to run uh, this decision procedure or, or you can do some I know, resolutions, etc. Oh, it's always like the first two resolutions that are positive decision procedures. Uh, so you always do always the decision, do procedure. decision procedure. Well, so isn't it kind of wasteful sometimes? Couldn't you very simply by by based on the? Mm. Oh, you mean only do resolution step can prove the problem mm -hmm. without any decision procedure? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, not so much a problem can be like very rare. Uh, yeah. Like every time, because for the resolution you will. Like uh, first, the substitute uh, uh, Russian functions to uh, make it polynomial, transform to polynomial functions. Then you use decision procedure to kind of deleting the literals to stay. And uh, usually, you can't be improved without decision procedure. Yeah. But could, could you, for example, say that, that at, at this particular step, there is a very Great likelihood the decision procedure will not do anything, so, so there is no point in call, calling. Would, would it make sense? Decision procedure. Well, sometimes decision procedure would, uh, uh, if I give like a longer time for each decision procedure call, it may, may do nothing because they try to spend too much time in each branch, so that's the reason. Uh, in the current experience, I'm just like uh, by setting different uh, ASEA decision code to to say because if I queue the process quite in quite short time, then kind of it wouldn't waste too much. So mm -hmm. I would just use 
but uh, without decision procedure, because uh, for those, uh, the formulas involve special functions, yeah. it's yeah. quite hard to just yeah. direct it to. Okay.
what, what, what are you predicting here? What, what, what's the meaning of the leaf notes here? Uh, leaf note is a plain text or not. Uh -huh. He has a uh -huh. uh, So I choose vectors, this tool for uh, using the thing tree learn and uh, cross have a collection of values in the thing tree and uh, for data analysis and predictive modeling. And uh, the vector, uh, the dual uh, vector, works like uh, you know, get the training data, data set, and work in a predictive model, model, and then use this model to test the uh, test the data set and get some result information. And uh, I have uh, two experiments where we have taken, and uh, the data will be as the two data set. One is the training data set with 100 uh, instances and uh, the another test the data, data set with uh, 100 data set as well. 100 instances as well, but uh, we have 17 different values uh, from the chain data set. I chose it to that. And the first one, we uh, use the chain data set to work in the predictive model and then uh, test themselves and uh, say the how uh, uh, how you can work the existing entries in the training data set. And uh, second, the X experiment uh, will be the, be the, training, the same training data set uh, to work in the predictive model and then test the test data set, which I mentioned before. And the first one, uh, this is uh, the result of force uh, 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 experiment. And uh, we can look at what's the the first column is the average name of the trees that in the vector. And the second will be the graphic hash type and the instances. So it will be the testing result. And uh, we can look at here and uh, the testing result will be around the 98%, which is a very high percentage. Uh, in the second uh, experiment, uh, we can see the, the testing result. Uh, the degree is uh, around 10%, is around, the result is uh, around 88%. Uh, mm, it's a decrease of 10%, uh, it's a decrease of quite a lot. Because I just uh, add 17 different values, I can get uh, a lot of decreases. So the result, uh, so the result, the uh, decision trees, has a good classification and prediction for the existing instances, but uh, it's not as good as expensive for the unknown, unknown prediction. So uh, in the future work, uh, and uh, after even the same tree, and find the correct, uh, in, incorrect prediction in the process, and uh, have some analysis and try to reduce the many operations as much as possible. Uh, so what, what, what were you exactly using as, as the input for, for, for the experiments so when you were showing the, the, this, um, the, this, I think the So, so you have 
some, some large data set in, in, in which that there are many different attributes to it. And statics have a lot of like this set for what the statistics analyze. Uh, but uh, it gets uh, raw data mm -hmm. uh, if you upload in the, in the software or it gets some problems. But actually, you do some manual operation. Uh -huh. Change. So, actually, I should have to reduce this.
represented in variables and that have some kind of domains, more often finite than not, not non-finite, and constraints that describe how those variables affect each other. So if we have a standard constraint solver, it's usually rather a complex and sophisticated pro uh, piece of software that <laughs> is able to handle any kind of problem that we throw at it that can be described in the, with, with the associated language and usually goes in a similar mod in a model like this. So by the problem model and some parameters that describes a specific instance of the problem to the some kind of solver, you, know, you, you are not necessarily know what happens inside the solver. It's almost like a black box. You can do some tuning to it, but generally you have little idea what's happening inside and it just gives you out a solution. Uh, in our approach, which we call Dominion, it is slightly more complicated than that. Uh, the main difference is that we do not try to build something that is, is able to handle anything you throw at it. We analyze the problem specifically, see what specific functions it needs to achieve that specific goal, and then access our own database and compile a specific solver for that specific problem, which is most likely a lighter version than a more generic solver. So as you can see, we separate the problem model and the parameters, so we are building solver that is able to handle the whole class of problems. So, for example, if we would, would, would but possibly we would be able to build a solver for a traveling salesman problems. And you would just, this solver would be able to handle all those various instances. So you would just input the data of the towns that the salesman <laughs> have to visit. And it would just give you a, a solve that specific problem. Um, uh, the thing is with this approach that we have quite a large number of components in our database from which to build that solver. And it's very difficult to see which components are best for any specific solver. Because I haven't applied here here, but the component structure of our solvers is like a tree. So and that tree, the shape of that tree is not consistent. It depends on what kind of functionality we need. So every component depends on some other components. And the, even the, uh, the final solvers, even for that specific, uh, for a very specific problem, can drastically vary between the instances. Can, can, can you give an example of the components of the uh, later? Yes. Uh, for example, in, there are many components that are more familiar would be uh, memory managers, how the memory is managed, how the various variables are actually stored in memory, how are uh, the access to variable order, that in a sense. There are algorithms for performing specific functions, for example, it, uh, making sure that all variables are different for all different constraints. So everything like that can be a specific constraint, a specific component. And it goes to a much deeper level for those propagators who can even have specific components, how you perform backtracking and so on. So, so it seems that you, you almost have meta constraints between these components because one component might require another component. That's yes, and okay. this actually complicates this uh, very much because we have this complex component structure we cannot apply generic techniques to it that allow us to navigate it. So one of the solutions we, we hope that will achieve, let us achieve our goals is Monte Carlo tree search. This is relatively new search. It's been first publications about it was from 2006. It's the best first search algorithm. Uh, the key things about it, it does not rely on the domain knowledge. 
It can benefit from it, but it's not a requirement. And it can handle a large search space because it just selects some components, samples them, and then expands its own knowledge of those components as it moves along. Uh, it has been shown, uh, this is most popular in the uh, game modeling. For example, the Japanese game of Go is solved with Monte Carlo research, and as far as I know, that's the only algorithm that was able to solve it. In my time time or something like that. It's clearly really not solved in the general case. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, that's the closest we have. So, the Monte Carlo works in basically in four steps. It selects, uh, it assumes that all the decisions can be made in a sequence first. So it selects some decisions that were already tested. So a selection step, expansion step, it adds some more decisions to the top after those, performs some simulations to see if those decisions were beneficial or not, and then back propagates and updates the value of all those decisions. Then goes to the step one, and then selects, once again selects some decisions from the stuff that's already tested. It might be some stuff that it just tested in the previous iteration. It might not. It depends on the various heuristics, and, it's, and they generate problem specific. Uh, for the dominion, oh, we implement this by maintaining two data structures. The partial tree, because it's not necessarily a sequential decision here. We have to build our complex tree. <coughs> And open nodes list would be the next nodes that would be outliers of the tree, the nodes can, that can be assigned next. So we could put one of the outlier nodes, evaluate all the choices for that specific node. So the node would be, for example, a memory manager. We just check, uh, select, assign each of the possible memory managers and per perform a number simulations for each of those memory managers. Uh, this gives an approximation of how well perform, each of them performs. But what, can, can, can you do this while the other choices aren't made yet? Or are, are you kind of doing it when the other choices are also made? Uh, that's the thing. We basically try to not commit uh, uh, to anything, but we cannot test uh, the solver until it's fully built. Yeah. So during our simulation step, basically assign all the remaining components at hand. And we perform some, a number of these simulations to get a better distribution. So after performing a number of simulations, we evaluate that, for example, in this case, memory manager, and commit to that memory manager, add it to the, our partial tree, and repeat the whole process. It is slightly more limiting than the standard Monte Carlo approach because it only basically backtracks only one step and what we would expect from Monte Carlo to backtrack whatever it takes. Uh, this was done partially due, well, mostly due to the complexity of our tree. Right now we are experimenting with the backtracking and restarts, but it's yet to be seen how that goes along. Um, basically, these are some preliminary results. These are the relation. Uh, we ran, we, basically, what we did was give the minion a problem to play with for a day or so, after which it gives us a solver it thinks as quite reasonable. Uh, and we compare that to a minion, uh, other constra simple constraint solver, with the four different configurations of each. And they took a ratio. So we have here seven different problems, worst, case, worst and best performing minions, and the, the minions for each. Uh, as, we, as you can tell, that there are quite a few cases where the minion is still losing by a factor of three, four, five, and up to ten. That's not very desirable yet, obviously, but it is still competitive. 
And it has to be said that in the worst case, we're losing by a factor of 100. That's quite a lot. But in the best cases, we are winning by a factor of thousands. It has to be said that for, both, uh, for minion, if you hand tune the minion, you can get a better results. But uh, in other cases, we are aiming for the system that does not require user input. And at the same time, we are not done yet. How complicated is it? How, how many components are you tuning? Uh, basically, for um, I haven't even tried it for a very complex problem, but for moderately complex problems, we can generate up to millions of different solvers. So the search, search space is quite high. And the, diff, uh, the other important thing about the testing here is that our simulations are actually quite expensive when compared to other approaches that use Monte Carlo resource. Because basically, to get uh, accurate results, we have to solve the problem. And for obviously, for more complex problems, it can take quite a while, I say an hour, and possibly more if it, the problem is really complex. So, testing is kind of biggest time consuming thing here, and we're trying to cut down the search space of millions. Um, yeah, so the, big, the biggest problem right now is that sometimes, since we are not backtracking a lot, we make some very bad decisions early on, because after all, we are sampling randomly, so we can run into some very bad decisions. And as I said, no backtracking or restarts mean that those early decisions can just mess up everything else. So that's the main reason we are investigating those approaches. Uh, we also are looking into how to judge the components better, to see that, to apply some kind of confidence scores to not make those terrible decisions early on. Uh, the other thing is, we are right now assuming that the components are independent, that Choosing one component does not affect the performance of other components. Uh, this is almost definitely not the case. But for the time being, it serves our purposes, but that's definitely something to look on, into later on. And the most immediate goal after we finish the current step of backtracking and propagation would be adding some kind of machine learning. Because if we can extract some data from the current test and apply that to reduce the, the test we need to work for a new problem, that would be massive improvement or massive search spaces. Yeah. I don't see how the system you described is making the assumption that the components, that the goodness of the components is independent. Because you, you make this, you don't evaluate until so you make this, until so you build a complete system, and then that tells you the value of the complete system. It doesn't tell you for, for that sequence. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you in the, independently. That would be the case if we sampled a large, uh, large enough number of components. We can, right now, we cannot assume that we sampled the right combinations of components to discern the right relationship. Um, yeah, I, that's so interesting. I, I, I think it, Quite related to, to what people do in automated pre pre so 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 one, one thing which worked for me quite quite well was um, really these uh, parameter iterative local search, which is is a different method than the uh, Monte Carlo, uh, but uh, I, I can imagine that generative programming might, might also work for all. Uh, and one thing uh, which might also work to add 
the, this kind of background knowledge, the, this kind of memory to it would, would, would be something like in, in that would be programming. Uh, and one point about the, the cost of evaluation, yeah, that, that, that's really something which eventually you uh, have to do, otherwise it will bite you for, for, for the rest of your life. Uh, so so how, 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 one way how uh, this can be done is that you really cluster problems into uh, into classes where from, from which you take the simple ones to, to train it on and, and then uh, as, 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 as you become better and better you, you solve problems faster and faster so you can train also but, but the, the, the way how to do the clustering is for example look at exactly what, what, what are the combinations of components that, that work on them. So, so that, that, that will give you the cost here if you, if you take the simpler ones from that, that the, the, the training time will be so crazy high. You don't have to run it on the instances which can take one hour, for example. Yes. Uh, a little bit of that, for example, we still have that last and we supply a number of just instances for it to test on various difficulties. And obviously, it's not able to run all of them on all four. Yeah. There are some simple ones. Yeah. Well, so, no, well, one way, um, well, one, one, how, how I do it is that I, I really run all of the small instances, and occasionally I, I, I run the big instance. Well, just, just in case that the thing has improved so much that, that it's capable of sol solving the big instance in reasonable time. Yeah, it's, then, a, yeah. it's also rather difficult to tell what is easy or hard instance because not uh, oh, I can't really think of any problem class where it actually scales properly. And different completed solvers can have different, uh, for different solvers, different instances can be considered to hard as well. Oh. So, 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 so for, for example, for so, uh, automated characters, you, you really have to be decent metrics, like this, this number of given calls loops or uh, like a top, top, top low previous, you could count the number of extensions steps, steps, for example. So, so I, I can imagine that you, you, you would have some internal metrics which would kind of give, give you the scaling. Like if you go from nine queens, queens to ten, ten queens, how, 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 how much it blows up in terms of the in, internal, internal. That's it. Uh, 24, 25 things might be harder than 24, but easier than 24. Yeah. Right. Well, then, I think we are done with the session. Thank you. Before we go, can I thank Joseph for such a wonderful chairing? I was really enjoying the chairing. Thanks so much. We have now a coffee break and then we'll return for machine learning in a way to create a discussion here and then we'll have a session at the end.